NASA, now they know how many holes it takes to fill the Albert Hall situation because researchers have measured the actual blood alcohol level of fans leaving professional football and baseball games. And they found that 8% of all the spectators willing to take the breathalyzer exam were over the legal limit for driving. The work appears in the journal Alcoholism, Clinical and Experimental Research. The investigators managed to get breath samples from 362 fans exiting 13 different baseball games and three football games. 40% registered some level of alcohol on the meters. Fans under the age of 35 were nine times more likely to be over the limit than older fans, and tailgaters were 14 times more likely than other fans to be over the limit. Lead researcher Darren Erickson of the University of Minnesota points out that if the 8% finding holds for the whole crowd, at the conclusion of an NFL game, some 5,000 people people over the limit could spill out into the streets and potentially behind the wheel. Remember, these results apply to those willing to be tested, so the true percentage of uncooperative inebriates may be higher. It's a now they know how many holes it takes to fill the Albert Hall situation because researchers have measured the actual blood alcohol level of fans leaving professional football and baseball games. And they found that 8% of all the spectators willing to take the breathalyzer exam were over the legal limit for driving. The work appears in the journal Alcoholism, Clinical and Experimental Research. The investigators managed to get breath samples from 362 fans exiting 13 different baseball games and three football games. 40% registered some level of alcohol on the meters. Fans under the age of 35 were nine times more likely to be over the limit than older fans, and tailgaters were 14 times more likely than other fans to be over the limit. Lead researcher Darren Erickson of the University of Minnesota points out that if the 8% finding holds for the whole crowd, at the conclusion of an NFL game, some 5,000 people over the limit could spill out into the streets and potentially behind the wheel. Remember, these results apply to those willing to be tested, so the true percentage of uncooperative inebriates may be higher. To a female orb web spider, a suitable male can look like a mate and a meal. For these spiders, the dating game has turned into a deadly dance of evolutionary one-upsmanship. The female spider can choose when to cut off intimate relations by eating her partner or kicking him out. This dynamic has led males to an unlikely strategy to make sure they have some say in the matter, self-castration. Males are able to leave part or all of their organ inside of a female, which decreases the odds the female will be able to mate again but new research shows that when a male leaves his whole kitten caboodle behind, his likelihood of fathering the next batch of eggs is much higher. Why? His parting gift keeps on giving, even after he is gone. This remote copulation technique actually boosts the amount and speed of sperm transferred to the female. The behavior is described in the journal Biology Letters. So, for these unlucky fellas, it is better to have loved and lost. To a female orb web spider, a suitable male can look like a mate and a meal. For these spiders, the dating game has turned into a deadly dance of evolutionary one-upsmanship. The female spider can choose when to cut off intimate relations by eating her partner or kicking him out. This dynamic has led males to an unlikely strategy to make sure they have some say in the matter, self-castration. Males are able to leave part or all of their organ inside of a female, which decreases the odds the female will be able to mate again. But new research shows that when a male leaves his whole kitten caboodle behind, his likelihood of fathering the next batch of eggs is much higher. Why? His parting gift keeps on giving, even after he is gone. This remote copulation technique actually boosts the amount and speed of sperm transferred to the female. The behavior is described in the journal Biology Letters. So, for these unlucky fellas, it is better to have loved and lost. In vitro fertilization efforts can be helped by, oddly enough, oral contraceptives. That's the finding from Tel Aviv University, site of the largest study on using birth control to help IVF. One of the challenges to IVF is timing. Current hormone treatments to stimulate ovulation have to coincide with a particular moment in the woman's cycle. Not knowing the exact timing for scheduling the egg retrieval and fertilization can be stressful, which can lower the odds of success. In the Tel Aviv study, researchers looked at women who underwent a 12 to 17 day treatment of oral contraception. The women were checked to make sure there was absolutely no activity in their ovaries or uterus. 
Then they began stimulation hormones to start the clock. Women who went through this protocol had similar numbers of pregnancies to a control group that didn't use birth control, which means that oral contraception didn't harm their ability to conceive. The researchers say this treatment demands a slightly longer cycle and higher levels of ovulation-inducing hormones, but they also say it could allow couples to more accurately plan for procedures, which might give couples more peace of mind. In vitro fertilization efforts can be helped by, oddly enough, oral contraceptives. That's the finding from Tel Aviv University, site of the largest study on using birth control to help IVF. One of the challenges to IVF is timing. Current hormone treatments to stimulate ovulation have to coincide with a particular moment in the woman's cycle. Not knowing the exact timing for scheduling the egg retrieval and fertilization can be stressful, which can lower the odds of success. In the Tel Aviv study, researchers looked at women who underwent a 12 to 17 day treatment of oral contraception. The women were checked to make sure there was absolutely no activity in their ovaries or uterus. Then they began stimulation hormones to start the clock. Women who went through this protocol had similar numbers of pregnancies to a control group that didn't use birth control, which means that oral contraception didn't harm their ability to conceive. The researchers say this treatment demands a slightly longer cycle and higher levels of ovulation-inducing hormones, but they also say it could allow couples to more accurately plan for procedures, which might give couples more peace of mind. I once took part in a vodka tasting contest in which participants tried to tell an expensive brand from a cheap one. I don't recall the exact outcome, for obvious reasons, but I do know that several people swore they could taste the difference. Well, maybe they could, because according to a study in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry, different vodkas can have different molecular structures, which could drive drinkers to favor one brand over another. Vodka is an alcoholic beverage that's supposed to be relatively flavorless. So researchers got to wondering, how come people who enjoy this stuff often express brand preference? Being good little scientists, they trotted out their spectroscopic equipment and examined the chemical signatures of five different vodkas. What they found is that each brand differs in how its ethanol molecules cluster. In the ethanol water mix we call vodka, some of the ethanol molecules get surrounded by a sort of cage made of water. And different brands differ in how much ethanol is caged. Vodkas with fewer cages might seem more watery than those with more structure. Of course, drink enough of the stuff, and it really won't matter how tightly caged it is. You'll be loose as a gray goose. I once took part in a vodka tasting contest in which participants tried to tell an expensive brand from a cheap one. I don't recall the exact outcome, for obvious reasons, but I do know that several people swore they could taste the difference. Well, maybe they could, because according to a study in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry, different vodkas can have different molecular structures, which could drive drinkers to favor one brand over another. Vodka is an alcoholic beverage that's supposed to be relatively flavorless. So researchers got to wondering, how come people who enjoy this stuff often express brand preference? Being good little scientists, they trotted out their spectroscopic equipment and examined the chemical signatures of five different vodkas. What they found is that each brand differs in how its ethanol molecules cluster. In the ethanol water mix we call vodka, some of the ethanol molecules get surrounded by a sort of cage made of water, and different brands differ in how much ethanol is caged. Vodkas with fewer cages might seem more watery than those with more structure. Of course, drink enough of the stuff, and it really won't matter how tightly caged it is. You'll be loose as a gray goose. Emphysema and cystic fibrosis patients who need new lungs are faced with a life-threatening problem. More than 80% of donated lungs can't be used. They're inflamed and barely functional. But a new approach, detailed this week in the new journal Science Translational Medicine, describes a novel gene therapy that can repair these damaged lungs and make them available for transplant. Researchers first developed a system for preserving the lungs. They put the organs in a glass chamber and kept them functioning and at human body temperature. This technique proved better than freezing. Then they inserted into the lungs a gene called IL-10. The gene plays a key role in inhibiting the immune response. About six hours after injection, the cells start producing proteins that combat the damaging inflammation. The presence of the IL-10 gene may also lower the chances that the recipient of the lung will reject the transplanted organ. After the gene therapy, treated lungs showed improved blood flow and were significantly better at taking in oxygen and expelling carbon dioxide. The technique could double the number of lungs available for transplant, truly making patients breathe easier. 
Emphysema and cystic fibrosis patients who need new lungs are faced with a life-threatening problem. More than 80% of donated lungs can't be used. They're inflamed and barely functional. But a new approach, detailed this week in the new journal Science Translational Medicine, describes a novel gene therapy that can repair these damaged lungs and make them available for transplant. Researchers first developed a system for preserving the lungs. They put the organs in a glass chamber and kept them functioning and at human body temperature. This technique proved better than freezing. Then they inserted into the lungs a gene called IL-10. The gene plays a key role in inhibiting the immune response. About six hours after injection, the cells start producing proteins that combat the damaging inflammation. The presence of the IL-10 gene may also lower the chances that the recipient of the lung will reject the transplanted organ. After the gene therapy, treated lungs showed improved blood flow and were significantly better at taking in oxygen and expelling carbon dioxide. The technique could double the number of lungs available for transplant, truly making patients breathe easier. In the day of the dinosaur, insects had wingspans of nearly two and a half feet. So why are today's bugs so puny? According to researchers at UC Santa Cruz, we may have birds and bats to thank. Their conclusions appear in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. If you ever sat through a high school biology course, you might remember hearing that insects are limited in size by their ability to utilize oxygen. The bigger you get, the harder it is to get O2 to your tissues. And bugs don't have lungs to help. To test the oxygen connection, researchers turned to fossils. They charted the wingspan of more than 10,000 fossilized insects and found that for the first 150 million years of bug evolution, size tracked closely with atmospheric oxygen levels. The more O2, the bigger the bugs. But then insects started shrinking, even though oxygen continued to rise. This wave of reduction happens to coincide with the emergence of anatomical features that made birds more agile, airborne predators. And insects got even smaller about 60 million years ago when bats hit the scene. Being little makes you harder to catch which may have given bugs with teeny wings an evolutionary leg up. In the day of the dinosaur, insects had wingspans of nearly two and a half feet. So why are today's bugs so puny? According to researchers at UC Santa Cruz, we may have birds and bats to thank. Their conclusions appear in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. If you ever sat through a high school biology course, you might remember hearing that insects are limited in size by their ability to utilize oxygen. The bigger you get, the harder it is to get O2 to your tissues. And bugs don't have lungs to help. To test the oxygen connection, researchers turned to fossils. They charted the wingspan of more than 10,000 fossilized insects and found that for the first 150 million years of bug evolution, size tracked closely with atmospheric oxygen levels. The more O2, the bigger the bugs. But then insects started shrinking, even though oxygen continued to rise. This wave of reduction happens to coincide with the emergence of anatomical features that made birds more agile, airborne predators. And insects got even smaller about 60 million years ago when bats hit the scene. Being little makes you harder to catch, which may have given bugs with teeny wings an evolutionary leg up. Olive oil is thought to be healthy because it's mostly monounsaturated fat, but cold-pressed extra virgin olive oil may have an extra benefit. It appears to be more filling than other fats. That's according to research presented at a German symposium on fat. Researchers started by feeding 120 volunteers a daily 18-ounce serving of low-fat yogurt, but mixed in the yogurt were three tablespoons of either extra virgin olive oil, canola oil, butter, or lard. Turns out volunteers in the olive oil group reported feeling more full during the three-month study period, and they had larger concentrations of serotonin in their blood, a signal of satiety. The researchers say extra virgin olive oil contains aromatic compounds that block the absorption of glucose from the blood, delaying the recurrence of hunger. Indeed, study subjects who ate yogurt with just olive oil extract consumed fewer calories over a three-month period than those who ate plain yogurt, and they finished the trial with less body fat, too. Which leads these researchers to conclude that olive oil extract could be key to creating a better low-fat snack. Tastes great, more filling. Olive oil is thought to be healthy because it's mostly monounsaturated fat. But cold-pressed extra virgin olive oil may have an extra benefit. It appears to be more filling than other fats. That's according to research presented at a German symposium on fat. Researchers started by feeding 120 volunteers a daily 18-ounce serving of low-fat yogurt. But mixed in the yogurt were three tablespoons of either extra virgin olive oil, canola oil, butter, or lard. Turns out volunteers in the olive oil group reported feeling more full during the three-month study period. 
and they had larger concentrations of serotonin in their blood, a signal of satiety. The researchers say extra virgin olive oil contains aromatic compounds that block the absorption of glucose from the blood, delaying the recurrence of hunger. Indeed, study subjects who ate yogurt with just olive oil extract consumed fewer calories over a three-month period than those who ate plain yogurt. And they finished the trial with less body fat, too. Which leads these researchers to conclude that olive oil extract could be key to creating a better low-fat snack. Tastes great, more filling. Oh. That grinning, glowing globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian. It's Halloween. That's how Orson Welles ended his Mercury Theater version of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds on October 30th, 1938. The broadcast was designed to sound like live news coverage of an invasion of Earth by Martians, and a lot of people fell for it. Now there's some more Martian misinformation fooling folks. This one's not so scary. A lot of people are getting email claiming that in the next few weeks, the planet Mars will get close enough to the Earth so that it will appear to be about the same size as the moon. Our friends at Sky and Telescope magazine report that email dating back to 2003 mentioned that in a 75 times magnifying telescope, Mars would look about as big as the moon does to the naked eye. Somewhere along the line, the telescope part got lost. So don't worry, Mars, even at its closest, is still small and safely far away. It's Halloween. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian. It's Halloween. That's how Orson Welles ended his Mercury Theater version of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds on October 30th, 1938. The broadcast was designed to sound like live news coverage of an invasion of Earth by Martians, and a lot of people fell for it. Now there's some more Martian misinformation fooling folks. This one's not so scary. A lot of people are getting email claiming that in the next few weeks, the planet Mars will get close enough to the Earth so that it will appear to be about the same size as the moon. Our friends at Sky and Telescope magazine report that email dating back to 2003 mentioned that in a 75 times magnifying telescope, Mars would look about as big as the moon does to the naked eye. Somewhere along the line, the telescope part got lost. So don't worry, Mars, even at its closest, is still small and safely far away. It's Halloween. If you ever get an infection of the cornea and you wear contact lenses, save the lenses. They could help your doctor figure out what medication would be the best bet to cure what ails you. Wearing contacts is associated with an increased risk of microbial keratitis or corneal eye infection. Such an infection can sometimes lead to complications that might threaten your sight. Doctors will take a scraping from the cornea and then try to identify whatever organisms are present. But in a study reported in the September issue of Archives of Ophthalmology, only 34% of corneal scrapings from contact lens wearing keratitis patients allowed researchers to identify the microbes involved. But 70% of contact lenses from the affected patients harbored microbes. The study included 49 patients with a total of 50 infected eyes seen at a hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Said one of the study's authors, Contact lens culture may give a clue regarding the identity of the causative organism in situations in which the corneal scraping is culture negative and may help in choosing the appropriate antimicrobial agent. If you ever get an infection of the cornea and you wear contact lenses, save the lenses. They could help your doctor figure out what medication would be the best bet to cure what ails you. Wearing contacts is associated with an increased risk of microbial keratitis or corneal eye infection. Such an infection can sometimes lead to complications that might threaten your sight. Doctors will take a scraping from the cornea and then try to identify whatever organisms are present. But in a study reported in the September issue of Archives of Ophthalmology, only 34% of corneal scrapings from contact lens wearing keratitis patients allowed researchers to identify the microbes involved. But 70% of contact lenses from the affected patients harbored microbes. The study included 49 patients with a total of 50 infected eyes seen at a hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Said one of the study's authors, Contact lens culture may give a clue regarding the identity of the causative organism in situations in which the corneal scraping is culture negative and may help in choosing the appropriate antimicrobial agent.
it's not easy being yellow, bananas now face two separate fungal epidemics which threaten to pluck the fruit off of our tables. Fortunately, researchers have now sequenced banana DNA, producing the genome of a banana variety that may hold the secret to defeating the diseases. The report is in the journal Nature. Today, half of all bananas, including the ones you probably buy, belong to the Cavendish variety, whose popularity stems in part from having no seeds. But this trait also removes sexual reproduction from the equation. The bananas are thus all genetically identical and identically vulnerable to the two fungal epidemics, Panama disease and black leaf streak disease. Researchers sequenced the genome of a banana variety called D.H. Pahang, whose genes contributed to the Cavendish. While the genome shows where this fruit fits in the history of plant evolution, it could also help researchers understand why D.H. Pahang, unlike its descendant, is resistant to the funguses behind both Panama and black leaf streak disease. Knowing the genes responsible for this resistance could help breeders create stronger, more resistant bananas, which has a lot of appeal. It's not easy being yellow. Bananas now face two separate fungal epidemics which threaten to pluck the fruit off of our tables. Fortunately, researchers have now sequenced banana DNA, producing the genome of a banana variety that may hold the secret to defeating the diseases. The report is in the journal Nature. Today, half of all bananas, including the ones you probably buy, belong to the Cavendish variety, whose popularity stems in part from having no seeds. But this trait also removes sexual reproduction from the equation. The bananas are thus all genetically identical and identically vulnerable to the two fungal epidemics, Panama disease and black leaf streak disease. Researchers sequenced the genome of a banana variety called D.H. Pahang, whose genes contributed to the Cavendish. While the genome shows where this fruit fits in the history of plant evolution, it could also help researchers understand why D.H. Pahang, unlike its descendant, is resistant to the funguses behind both Panama and black leaf streak disease. Knowing the genes responsible for this resistance could help breeders create stronger, more resistant bananas, which has a lot of appeal. That's Generation Zero of Darwin Tunes. It's a website researchers are using to study how listener preferences affect the evolution of music. A new study claims that the taste of the public exerts a force on music similar to natural selection. The findings support the theory that culture and art are shaped not only by their producers, but by consumers, too. The report is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Researchers created short tunes and allowed them to procreate. That is, they'd combine aspects of the parent tunes to produce a new generation of music. User ratings on the Darwin Tunes site provided the evolutionary selection, with only the most appealing tunes allowed to create progeny. The researchers found that quality increased quickly at the beginning. The random sounds rapidly gave rise to something an awful lot like music. Here's Generation 600. But after a while, things stagnated. The researchers planned to update the program to drive evolution further. Meanwhile, here's Darwin Tunes Generation 3000. That's Generation Zero of Darwin Tunes. It's a website researchers are using to study how listener preferences affect the evolution of music. A new study claims that the taste of the public exerts a force on music similar to natural selection. The findings support the theory that culture and art are shaped not only by their producers, but by consumers, too. The report is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Researchers created short tunes and allowed them to procreate. That is, they'd combine aspects of the parent tunes to produce a new generation of music. User ratings on the Darwin Tunes site provided the evolutionary selection, with only the most appealing tunes allowed to create progeny. The researchers found that quality increased quickly at the beginning. The random sounds rapidly gave rise to something an awful lot like music. Here's Generation 600. But after a while, things stagnated. The researchers planned to update the program to drive evolution further. Meanwhile, here's Darwin Tunes Generation 3000. Crop rotation is a recognized way to keep soil and the food ecosystem healthy. Now scientists are saying that rotation could be a useful tool in the sea. Researchers tracked a shallow water nearshore species used for food, sea cucumbers. They're easy to harvest and are fairly valuable, but those same attributes mean they're easy to overharvest. The practice has put some sea cucumber species at high risk of extinction, even in a relatively well-managed area, the Great Barrier Marine Park in Australia. 
In 2004, authorities split the Great Barrier Reef into 154 zones, where each zone was fished only once every three years. Fishers rotate through the region. In computer models, the researchers ran through dozens of simulations of each zone, both before and after the divisions took place. The trials revealed that even with an identical and low catch allowance in all cases, the sea cucumbers would recover more fully under the rotation strategy than by harvesting simultaneously throughout the region. In fact, in trials that included rotations, the yield actually increased. The research is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The scientists say their results suggest that such rotation might be beneficial in these kinds of shallow marine regions around the world, particularly for species that are in high demand, because you should not eat your seed corn or your seed seed cucumbers. Crop rotation is a recognized way to keep soil and the food ecosystem healthy. Now scientists are saying that rotation could be a useful tool in the sea. Researchers tracked a shallow water nearshore species used for food, sea cucumbers. They're easy to harvest and are fairly valuable, but those same attributes mean they're easy to overharvest. The practice has put some sea cucumber species at high risk of extinction, even in a relatively well-managed area, the Great Barrier Marine Park in Australia. In 2004, authorities split the Great Barrier Reef into 154 zones, where each zone was fished only once every three years. Fishers rotate through the region. In computer models, the researchers ran through dozens of simulations of each zone, both before and after the divisions took place. The trials revealed that even with an identical and low catch allowance in all cases, the sea cucumbers would recover more fully under the rotation strategy than by harvesting simultaneously throughout the region. In fact, in trials that included rotations, the yield actually increased. The research is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The scientists say their results suggest that such rotation might be beneficial in these kinds of shallow marine regions around the world, particularly for species that are in high demand because you should not eat your seed corn or your seed seed cucumbers. If Alice is smart, and Bob's even smarter, working together they would A, be twice as smart, B, be half as smart, or C, form a task force and get nothing done. According to new research, the answer is none of the above. It would actually depend on how well they get along. What makes a group good at what it does? A team of scientists put their collective heads together and divided volunteers into groups of two to five. And they asked these groups to perform a variety of tasks, from brainstorming answers to questions like, what can you do with a brick, to team typing blocks of complicated text. What the researchers found is that the intelligence of individual group members was not a good predictor of how well the group as a whole performed. The teams that did best rated high in social sensitivity. Their members interacted well, took turns speaking, and included more females than groups that did poorly. The study is in the journal Science. So if you're looking for a recipe for group smart, don't automatically reach for the biggest brains. Try adding some heart, and at least one person who knows what to do with a brick. If Alice is smart, and Bob's even smarter, working together they would A, be twice as smart, B, be half as smart, or C, form a task force and get nothing done. According to new research, the answer is none of the above. It would actually depend on how well they get along. What makes a group good at what it does? A team of scientists put their collective heads together and divided volunteers into groups of two to five. And they asked these groups to perform a variety of tasks, from brainstorming answers to questions like, what can you do with a brick, to team typing blocks of complicated text. What the researchers found is that the intelligence of individual group members was not a good predictor of how well the group as a whole performed. The teams that did best rated high in social sensitivity. Their members interacted well, took turns speaking, and included more females than groups that did poorly. The study is in the journal Science. So if you're looking for a recipe for group smart, don't automatically reach for the biggest brains. Try adding some heart, and at least one person who knows what to do with a brick. If authorities wanted to determine how pervasive the problem of illicit drug use was in their communities, how could they do it? One cheap and easy way has just been tried experimentally in Oregon. Based on the principle that what goes in must come out, researchers measure the amounts and kinds of drugs that made their way through users 
to become included in untreated wastewater. This first-of-its-kind research is reported in the journal Addiction. 96 municipal water treatment facilities across Oregon volunteered for the study, which concentrated on finding evidence of the drugs meth, cocaine, and ecstasy. All samples were collected on the same day in areas that include about two-thirds of that state's population. Some findings. Evidence for cocaine use was primarily in urban areas, almost non-existent in rural regions. Ecstasy use tended toward urban areas as well, and only turned up in about half of all communities. Meth was everywhere. More important than those one-day snapshot findings, however, is that this methodology was proven viable and could be used to track patterns of drug use in multiple regions over time. If authorities wanted to determine how pervasive the problem of illicit drug use was in their communities, how could they do it? One cheap and easy way has just been tried experimentally in Oregon. Based on the principle that what goes in must come out, researchers measure the amounts and kinds of drugs that made their way through users to become included in untreated wastewater. This first-of-its-kind research is reported in the journal Addiction. 96 municipal water treatment facilities across Oregon volunteered for the study, which concentrated on finding evidence of the drugs meth, cocaine, and ecstasy. All samples were collected on the same day in areas that include about two-thirds of that state's population. Some findings. Evidence for cocaine use was primarily in urban areas, almost non-existent in rural regions. Ecstasy use tended toward urban areas as well, and only turned up in about half of all communities. Meth was everywhere. More important than those one-day snapshot findings, however, is that this methodology was proven viable and could be used to track patterns of drug use in multiple regions over time. Scientists discover new species all the time, on the order of 15,000 a year. One of the latest additions to the Tree of Life is a new type of leopard frog, which might sound unremarkable, except for where it was found. New York City. But how does a frog go unnoticed in the Big Apple? Well, even experts have a hard time telling this new species from its northern and southern cousins, on looks alone. But the new guy has a different croak, which raised ecologists' suspicions. So they track down four leopard frog populations with a unique call, including one within view of the Statue of Liberty, and took DNA samples. As they suspected, the odd croakers weren't southern or northern leopard frogs, or even a mix. They had a genetic ancestry of their own, earning them new species status. Those results appear in the journal Molecular Phylogenetics and Evolution. The frogs are tough New Yorkers. The center of their range appears to be Yankee Stadium. But the researchers say the urban amphibians face threats like pesticides and infectious diseases, not to mention real-life games of Frogger. Scientists discover new species all the time, on the order of 15,000 a year. One of the latest additions to the Tree of Life is a new type of leopard frog, which might sound unremarkable, except for where it was found. New York City. But how does a frog go unnoticed in the Big Apple? Well, even experts have a hard time telling this new species from its northern and southern cousins, on looks alone. But the new guy has a different croak, which raised ecologists' suspicions. So they tracked down four leopard frog populations with a unique call, including one within view of the Statue of Liberty, and took DNA samples. As they suspected, the odd croakers weren't southern or northern leopard frogs, or even a mix. They had a genetic ancestry of their own, earning them new species status. Those results appear in the journal Molecular Phylogenetics and Evolution. The frogs are tough New Yorkers. The center of their range appears to be Yankee Stadium. But the researchers say the urban amphibians face threats like pesticides and infectious diseases, not to mention real-life games of Frogger. <laughs>